Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Now, today I am so excited because I am joined by the amazing Jeff Teravinen. Uh, how you doing today, man? Well, amazing. How you doing? I'm glad we could do this. Oh, me too. This is so exciting for me. Um, before we talk about why you're here, though, Jeff, I would like for the people that don't know you to get to know you a little bit. Um, Jeff is an actor and voiceover actor known for his work across many different mediums. Uh, he's been a series regular on well-known TV shows like Dark Matter, 12 Monkeys, and especially The Christmas Chronicles for Netflix. Um, yeah. Working with Christopher Columbus, which is totally, totally awesome. Um, and most recently, he played Deputy LaBelle in Eli Ross, very highly anticipated and very well-received Thanksgiving. So I got to know, what was it like being a part of such a major film this year with Thanksgiving? It was pretty amazing. Um Basically, you know, I just went through the normal casting process, but I, but I do remember when I auditioned for it because I was, I was ticked off because it was one of those ones where you read it and you think, man, this would be incredible. There's no way that you'll get cast for it. So I, I even remember saying, like, this is a, this is a waste of time, but let's do it. I did it, and uh, yeah, I'll never forget getting the call. I was coming out of a clinic and. My uh, my agent told me, he says, I uh, hope you're free these times because I got some great news for you. And yeah, it was amazing, yeah. And it's such, that movie was such a breath of fresh air this year. Um, it was an original horror movie, but it, it definitely had its homages and nods to other horror movies that a lot of horror fans picked up on right away and absolutely fell in love with. So, um, you know, and I know working with Eli Roth had to be an amazing thing because he's a very well-established, you know, he's an icon in the horror world. So, um I'm very happy that you got the chance. What was it like being on set for Thanksgiving? Well, you know, it was interesting in a lot of ways. Um, you, could, I would honestly say I've worked with some great directors, um, and it's not a slight against anybody else, but Eli's the best actor-director um, I've ever worked with. He is, uh, you know, he's like one of those stereotypical that you dream about actors-director because he's an actor, and he knows how to communicate really well. He knows what he wants. Um, and he really does let you run free so many times. Uh, th things like, because there's a lot of stuff that we shot too that didn't make it in the movie. I'm hoping maybe it's on the DVDs or Blu-rays and stuff. But, you know, you, you do these scenes and suddenly he's like, you know what, Jeff? Like, I got a feeling you wanted to do this. Just, you do that. And if you want to add something, add to it. And if it doesn't work, hey, it doesn't work. A lot of times you don't get that. Uh, some, some sets can be really rigid. It's like stick to the script, stick to the blocking. Whereas um, Eli was constantly coming up with ideas on the fly or, or letting you do stuff. So it was a dream, man. Um, yeah, it was, it was an absolute dream. And I feel like that you're going to, as an actor, you're going to work harder for a director that works, you know, that gives you the reins. You know, hey, you want to try this? Go ahead and try it. If it works, we'll keep it. If not, we'll go back to the original way. But hey, if you got an idea, let's try it. You're not going to bring me an idea that you think is stupid because you're in the film too. You know, yeah. you don't want to bring the film down. So yeah, you I, really, I you really felt a part of that. it. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Like you, he really did make you feel part of the process, as opposed to like furniture in a room that he's arranging for the. I mean, again, there. I've worked with some great directors. There's maybe they're you consider them cold fish, and they're rigid on the way they work. Sometimes I remember, you know, when you first start out, the director is one of the few people you see. You also have all the executive producers have opinions and stuff, and. They're in Video Village, another area of the studio where you don't even really talk to them. So on this film, everybody was collaborative. You know, Jeff Rendell, the the other writer, you know, probably the main writer, really, and, and producer as well. All these guys were accessible. They were fun. Like, they're fun guys. So <laughs> what more could you ask for? Right. And you could see on screen how much fun you guys had because watching this movie, we're having fun. You know, it's a slasher. It's dark. It's, you know, there's a lot of very dark moments in this film, but yeah. we're still having fun throughout the film. Um, but that's so the thing, though. I, 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 sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but I keep telling people because no. I have so many people in my life that want to go see it. And they're like, I'm terrified of this. I'm terrified of slashers. And, and I'm not going to lie, it's a slasher film. But at the same point, it doesn't take itself too seriously. So it has the scares, but it's like, to me, it was always like a, like an amusement park where, you, you know, you have different areas of the park and some of them are funny because there's lots of funny moments, but then there's, you know, the splasher. But it never goes so serious where you feel icky at the end of the night, you know? I feel right. like it's more like, that was a thrill ride, man. And I completely agree with you. I have a lot of people, we're doing our top 10 horror movies of the year, 
and everybody I've talked to has that movie somewhere on their list. So when you can do something like that with a mainstream horror film to be on every single top 10 list of people I've talked to, that's pretty impressive. And you guys did a great job. Um, I know they just announced there's a sequel. I'm very excited to see what you guys bring back to the table for Thanksgiving too. You know, I'd like some leftovers. So um, I'm very excited to see where the, what direction we go in. Um, and then, you know, not only that, but another major milestone for you is video games and not just voiceover in video games, but you've done body work for video games too, correct? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's part of the game now. In the old days, it was, um, it was mostly voice work, but now you got to put on the funny suit and the dots all over your face and the, the crazy big helmet, which goes out to here. And yeah. that normal. But I, I love it. I love doing video games. And the characters you get to play are its almost unlimited because they paint you a certain way. So, Right. Well, I mean, and you look at some of the titles you've been a part of. Uh, Tom Clancy's Sam Fisher of Splinter Cell, uh, Far Cry 2, 5, and 6. Uh, you've also done you know, Resident Evil, Assassin's Creed, StarCraft, Star Fury. So, I mean, these are household names of games that you've been a part of. So, yeah. um, and now I got to ask, I know that... Obviously, they're in the same medium. You know, they're in the same world. But for you, what's the difference between being on film or being in a, doing the video game thing? Well, again, because of the motion capture and performance capture part of it, um, it's essentially the same thing. I mean, with video games, you do have voice. So your character, there'll be certain things where you just do voice, and that's fine. And there's also a lot of – I've done a lot of uh, – what do they call them? The non-player, the NPC characters that you yeah. interact with. You can't play them, but I'll, I've done a lot of those as well, which are fun because, you know, you get to kill yourself and stuff. But um, <laughs> but the other stuff, it's just like doing a play or, or a scene. In fact, it's, it's, I mean, if you really want to get technical, it's interesting because imagine on a film set, you, you shoot. So you'll shoot me as a medium and a close-up and you'll shoot me from like a wide angle and and then they'll turn the cameras around and shoot the other person or the other people on the scene. And it takes a long time. And each, each time they have to set all that up and light it and all that stuff. Whereas with, um, with video games, we say we're doing a scene and it's a two page scene, which is fairly long. Everything around you, there's sensors and it picks up everything you do. So you do the whole scene from start to finish. You generally don't cut and uh, you might nail it in the first one or two, and then you're on to the next one. And you start immediately because you don't have to set up lights. You don't have to fix props or switch locations. It's like a couple keystrokes, and suddenly, you know, you've gone from a ship, let's say, a sail at sea to uh, the port now, you know, or, or whatever. Right. And, you know, you have these wooden props, which, you know, they are shaped or right, plastic ones. They're like guns, but they're not. They're just these sort of shapes, and you sit on chairs, but really they're just uh, made out of like uh, scrap wood in a way, if you will. It's yeah. it's like a play that way, but you you have to prep. You have to know your lines. You have to, you know, delve into the character, make a backstory, everything that makes him grounded and real in you. Um, that's the key, right? Mm -hmm. When well, and you got to have the right inflictions. Those things matter when you're doing voiceovers, especially in video games, because like you said, people aren't seeing your face. They're not getting the emotion that's coming cr across on your face. So you got to make sure all your inflictions are done correctly. And I can't imagine how hard that is. You know, well, people look at voiceover say, work. And... Well, the voiceovers, for sure, because they want you to be able to emote and they want people to read it. But nowadays, honestly, the helmets that we wear, um, if you look on my Instagram page, i got pictures of it and videos. Like, they've got sensors all of them. And they've really nailed the facial and eye movements now. It used to be a thing where they could even do the facial movements fairly well, but it would be like this dead eye thing you'd get for animation and everything. But man, I mean, I see I see the cutscenes in many video games that you know enough that they'll make you cry. There's so there's so much emotion going on in there. Like it's yeah. they've 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 done it now. They've they've landed on the moon of emotion for for video games. Isn't it always funny how they're like? I remember when the N64 came out, and I was like, man, they'll never get any better than this. You know, yeah. this is like the Xbox Series X and where we've gone. You know, and I'm like. How could you possibly get any better than this? Like, yeah, you know, it's, no, it's, it's true. Like, no, but, that'll never happen. To how? How can you? You know, it's but impressive. It keeps happening. Um, right. You know, the big thing now is is like um, is VR, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've played much, but VR is crazy, um, and it's only getting better. So, you know, we're, in terms of realism and graphics and, and, and playability and that, so you know, and even there, I mean, who knows what it'll be in ten years from now? It's right. it's crazy. I mean, I'm I'm old enough to remember 
uh, a school, uh, they were doing a, a presentation of this new game called Pong, which was the two paddles and the, and the dip. And I just remember as a kid, like, how is this possible? You know, right. it's like magic or something. So I've seen the evolution go from uh, start to finish here. Yeah, you're going from Pong to Pac-Man to Mario Brothers to, yeah. you know, like you said, to uh, Splinter Cell, Far Cry, Resident Evil, you know, these things you're a part of. And man, that's truly amazing because you're living out the dream. You know, you're getting to be in the shows, the movies, you, the video games. You you are living out every dream I had from the point I was 7 to 37. So I'm really happy that you get a chance to do these things, man. And Thanksgiving, I do want to say what you guys knocked it out of the park. You gave us an amazing theater experience. The whole theater was having a good time during it. There was moments, like you said, we were scared. There's moments we were grossed out. There's moments where we were going, oh, you know, like it was just, it was just an amazing time, man. And I can't wait to see what the future holds for you. But that's in the future. And for now, Jeff, I would like to go back to the past. And mm -hmm. I would like to talk about what got you started in the horror genre, your first horror movie. And Jeff, the first horror movie that you watched was. I think the one that I remember the most was uh, Fiend Without a Face, which is an old 50s movie. It's something to do with brains, uh, them doing something to brains, and then the brains could fly and turn invisible. And I remember being so afraid of that, uh, watching it. It was my brother's birthday party, and I was watching it with my Uncle Alan. This is a long time ago. But I just remember being so freaked out by that. Um, and then, you know, you get into other ones. Salem's Lot was another big one when I was a kid. We watched that, and I was terrified. I was terrified to go in the woods at night or, yeah. you know, after yeah. certain scenes and that, or at my window, something would be scratching. And then we used to have, where I live in Toronto, um, we get a lot of Buffalo stations. And every week at 4 o'clock after school, they would have a theme week, and they would play movies. So you'd have Elvis week, which I used to love as well. But they had horror week. And there was this one, there was this one movie that just killed me called The Vulture. You can actually find it on YouTube, but I don't think it's a good movie, but there's moments in it which were pretty creepy. And I remember that this mutated spirit guy be would become half a vulture on the bottom and he would knock on the windows of his victims. And of course, people would come out there and all of a sudden grab them. But right. I would hear any noise at my window. That's The Vulture. And I was so worried about my brother for some reason that he would get up in the middle of the night and or that he would open up the window to the vampire and that's scratching like on on uh, Salem's Lot, so stuff like that, you know. And then it just kept going. I, I love horror; it's one of my favorite, it's one of my favorite genres. In fact, just this weekend, my daughter and I, parent of the year, I shouldn't have been watching with her, but she's old. She's older in age in terms of her ability to deal with stuff. She doesn't get scared like me. But we watched um, The Haunting of Hill House again. Um, and I just was like, this is a masterpiece, man. I would, yeah. I would love to do something like that. Flanagan is just, I'm going to get, I get the opportunity to meet him in March. Oh, oh that's and, amazing. Uh, yeah, I'm just like, I love everything he's ever done. And Hill House, like you said, it's scary, but the ability that they create the characters and you have a yeah. real Nelly, you have a real sympathy for Nell and Luke, you know, I can't anybody. Stop thinking about it. Like, mm -hmm. literally, and all of them and all the twists and, you know, who, like, again, like you said, he nailed. It's one thing to scare people, but it's another thing to draw them in in all those other ways. Like you have so much invested in them, you don't you, you know you, you you love them. You want them, to and be you don't safe. want to shut it off. No, you know? like you don't. And when you, I'm t the thing that got me the most is when you go back and you rewatch it and you see all the points where like um, Luke is in the treehouse or Steve is in his video game room, and you're always looking at that one window in the background now, and you're like, that's so damn genius how he was able to play all that into the red room. So. I mean, yeah, like I said, we watched the whole Haunting of Hill House in like a weekend. My wife and I, we just we couldn't shut it off. It was like we okay, we have to go to work, but right when we get back, we're gonna finish this damn series. So, um, man, I just I, I agree with you. I just rewatched it. I just rewatched Bly Manor as well. Um, I'm a huge fan of both of those. I'm about to do my second tour of Midnight Mass because I just I love Flanagan and his ability to write characters that are relatable and you have feelings for. You don't want yeah. anything bad to happen happened to them yeah it was definitely an emotional ride the other thing that's funny though i don't know if you got this but especially when you binge it um everywhere i go at night now for the last two nights i i, I feel like i'm seeing half faces in the corners of things yes, <laughs> like yes man so all the so background stuff. Really did that. It's, it's, it's genius you know to never give any attention to it but you know as a viewer if you're eagle eye you see the stuff is there but they never give you the attention they never go back to it they never yeah. pan back 
You just see it and it's done. And to me, that's great writing. Especially, yeah. I think it was episode four or five, where the whole uh, the whole episode is just like four unbroken shots. Yeah, that and was it's just like holy shit! Like you're like one of them was like an eighteen minute unbroken shot of going back and forth. It's like how are you? There's four cuts in the whole episode. That to me yeah. is the epitome of holy shit. I did a short film that was about 18 minutes, maybe 20 minutes um, like that. And I can tell you, those guys really have to work to get it down. I think we shot ours. I think it took four takes till the guy was happy. But there was the other thing was there was just so much reflective stuff. And I don't know how Alan Poon's name was. He's a, he's a good cinematographer now. But he was a kid then. Like he was a, this was a kind of a student film. Somehow he managed to know everybody's movements and lines and stuff and not pick up uh, reflections and it was uh, it was something else, but to do it at the scale those guys did, the amount of dialogue um, that was impressive. And that I mean that whole part again, going back to the horror, I, I get scared by gore to a degree, but supernatural is the one that really gets me. And the fact that the sister is in that coffin the whole time in the background, and every time you go past, you're just waiting for some crazy thing to happen. Yeah, you know, like the tension the whole time was just like, and then. One of the best jump scares of all time in the car, you know, when you have the sisters in the car and the Nell comes oh, up yeah, in the back fighting, seat. Yeah, Woo! yeah, that was a bad, <laughs> that was a bad day in Kennytown, man. I'll tell you that. That was I, I jumped pretty hard for that. I, I'm not, a, I'm not a jump scare guy. I jump scares usually don't get me, but that was so unexpected that it really, really took me by surprise. And yeah, you um, got me a few times during that show. <laughs> well, and you're talking about the ability to do, you know, a one take, a one shot. Um, Everybody has to be in sync. It's like you said, it's not just the actors. You know, your key grip, um, your mic boom guys, your cameramen. Everybody has to be all moving in, you know, one well-oiled yeah. machine. And I don't care if you're doing a short film, if you're doing a feature, if you're doing a TV show. If you can make an unbroken shot for longer than five to six minutes, good for you. That's absolutely amazing. That is so incredible to be able to watch people do that type of art and they did it in halloween 2018 you had that super long unbroken shot and it's just yeah, like yeah. good for you guys man like that's really incredible to watch those happen i always wonder though like because there's so much stress involved i always wonder like why do people do this to them <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but when you do it product, it's cool it's worth it yeah like it's really cool at the end of it but man oh man like i, I remember even when i'd i'd have lines coming up in the one i was doing and I, I try not to worry about that anyways, but it happens. Sometimes you'll, you have a break where you're not talking. It's like, where the hell am I in this scene? And on that one, it was awful because I remember going into the kitchen. I had to grab something out of the thing, uh, the, the fridge and say something. And for that one split second, it was like, I have no idea what I'm doing here. And we've been shooting for like 10 minutes. <laughs> Can you imagine oh. if you're the guy? Yeah, you're but, not the one that wants to mess up at that point. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's a scene like that <laughs> in Thanksgiving too, man. It's like, I'm so glad I didn't let my, my brain get on in me, but there's a theme where we come up in, into that, um, I don't know, the warehouse area and all the cop cars converge at once. Yes. And there's like a, a steady cam shot on me. And it starts with me actually before when we get, I get out of the car and to get to that place, you've got like, I don't know, 25 different cars and drivers and cops everywhere. And everybody would have to go back to ones if I screw up. But somehow each time I managed to get out of that car without my hat falling off and remember what I, but I was like, I think about it now and I'm just like, Oh, geez. Right. Th thank God it went swimmingly. Yeah. Yeah. Especially <laughs> with the, the second or third take we did. I remember saying to Eli, cause he asked me, you know, are you happy with that? And I said, I've got something I want to do on this one. That's when I, I, want, I don't want to give it away if people haven't seen it, but I, I let out a good yell, swear kind of thing. Cause I'm, he's frustrated in the thing, but yeah, that came out of, I was like, I know what I want to do here now. Right. Yeah, no, yeah, Eli, and, let you do it. And like I was saying, and that, that's a memorable part of the film. You know, people that have seen it know exactly what you're talking about right now. So yeah. that's, those are the things when you talk about an actor's director, you know, those are the things that really, really come to mind. Yeah, definitely. He's he's. I I really hope everything pans out. We get the that the sequel is still has a label, and uh, you know what I had heard was a, a sheriff label, but we'll see. You know, you never know, right? Because I would love fingers to work crossed, with man. My, you know, my fingers are crossed, and um, I want to take a little break real quick and let you guys know that if you want to stay up to date on that, I have all of Jeff's social media links down in the description as well. So the best way to know if we're going to be getting more sheriff label or get a sheriff label from Deputy Label is to follow him on social media down in the description. So 
you know, your, your horror life really started with three different movies. You know, we had The Vulture, Fiend Without a Face, Salem's Lot. But of those three movies, which scene would you say it was of those that affected you the most? Well, the scariest for me was, um, well, there was a hundred in Salem's Lot. But in Salem's Lot was the, uh, again, I don't know if you or the viewers remember that, but there's a scene when Danny Glick, I think his name is, he's one of the friends that gets taken by the vampire. He, sh he keeps coming to the window and scratching and you see this fog roll in and, you know, the kid's sleeping at night and, you know, he hears this scratching and he looks and there's this, this vampire dude. Yeah. It's even looking at the image, I get goosebumps, man. It's so creepy. Um, that for sure, that, that, like I said, that freaked me out like so much, mm -hmm. but, you know, and I get goosebumps. They, they did a Salem's Lot remake, and I don't. It's been shelved at the moment. It's supposed to come out last year. Then I was hearing it was going to come out this year directly to streaming, but it hasn't come out yet. Um, is is that a movie you're excited about? Because I know remakes, sequel, sequels, kind of all the rage. Um, is that a movie you'll be checking out, or is that kind of a let a sleeping dog lie type of thing? Yeah, honestly, I haven't got excited about too many remakes of anything of any genre. Um, if I love a movie at the time, there's a reason for it. Um, even if it's older, you know, I can see past maybe the acting is different and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, there's a lot of great ideas out there. I'd rather them see them do a great new idea. than. I mean, I don't want to say every uh, remake because there has been some now that I think about it. But, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't know if I'd think or the Salem's Lot was really good. And, yeah, you can tell at times it was made for television. I believe Toby Hooper was the the director, and obviously he's a great director. You know, yeah, think of stuff he's done. But I mean, at the end of the day, um, it was still it was it was for television. So there's things that happen in there that you can tell, like they're cutting to a commercial and whatever. But still, I mean, the story, the acting, um, everything is is so cool. It's mm -hmm. it holds it is up. its own time capsule, man. Yeah, but it holds up though. I actually believe that it, it's still creepy, scary, and and. Yeah, you can tell the makeup on the vampire guy is, you know, it's, but but again, right? You know, I don't know. Maybe I just have the ability. I can watch Vertigo from 1959, and or I think it's 59, and I still get that thrill. I know they talk differently in those movies and stuff. But... <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, even Salem's Lot, like you have the coffin scene. You know, that's the one that scared me to death as a kid when you see him in the coffin. Oh, when he's um, when they dig him, when he goes, to, he hears the noise yeah, in the. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say that. I thought about that when I was trying to figure the, the, the one scene. There's so many. That's what I'm saying. That's another yeah. one. Or when, the, a, when the guy's sitting in the chair rocking, you know, and the guy, when the old man goes into that room, you know, there's so many things in that movie that, like, freaked me out then. And when I think now, I, you know, even at my age, I still get, like, a ooh. Yeah. Well, and I mean, these movies are all super, especially Salem's Lot. You know, I know Fiend Without a Face, you guys should check out. And I have the link for the Vulture right down in the description. You guys can check that out if you haven't already. But, um, you know, we know that horror started for you with these movies. But now I do want to throw you a little bit of a curveball here for a second, Jeff. Um, my little buddy Ghostface is here, and he has a question for you. What's your favorite scary movie, Jeff? Uh, what is your favorite <laughs> horror movie of all time? Well, that's an easy one. Um, to this day, and I'm going to rewatch it soon. i got to get the nerve. Uh, it's still The Exorcist. And... Hereditary is probably a very close second, which I want to watch again sometime. But The Exorcist, it's like I'm too nervous to even watch it again. <laughs> Ever since I was a kid, I saw that one when I was fairly, probably too young to watch it as well. But yeah, that one really got in and, you know, never left. It was, again, it's just that kind of thing that scares me. Mm -hmm. See, and it's funny because The Exorcist will always have this taboo nature around it to me because... I was blessed. I'll never take it for granted. My mom and dad owned a mom and pop video store growing up. So I was able to, you know, get movies whenever I wanted to. And The Exorcist was the only movie my mom ever shut off. It was like, nope, we're not watching this. We're done. And so it always had that taboo around. I mean, right here, right next to me, I always have little Pazuzu. You can't see it, of course, but. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. No, I can see it. That's so cool. Yeah. I have that right on my dresser. I'll all the time like that movie is super important to me because that's the movie that as a boy you know i had already watched you know child's play pet cemetery all these movies and you know i was in love with horror and then my mom finally got the courage to watch it and my mom who was my hero my idol my everything she was scared so i was like there's something heavy about this if mom's scared there's something going on so 
Um, yeah, I, I completely understand where you're coming from with The Exorcist, man. Like, it's it, it's a classic for a reason. You know, they call it the scariest movie of all time, and there's a reason behind that. So, I, I'm, I can't argue it. And Hereditary, wow, what are the best? We went, we got, we got invited to a screener of that, and so we've seen it before. It was spoiled for us. I've never been had a theater experience like I did with that at the telephone pole scene. The whole oh, crowd yeah. went. <laughs> You know, like I got goosebumps right now. Like that was the craziest scene ever. Yeah, I mean, so, yeah, no holds barred, right? It's like it really took things to a different level. And again, it was like there was scenes like that. But then the one that really freaked me out the most, again, was just that. Um, uh, I forget the late character's name, but she's she's just had the funeral for her mother, and she's in her room with the with the the stuff she makes, the buildings and that. And you look in the corner and you think you see something, but you're like, you don't. But then you do. You realize that's the mother's face deep in the corner. Yes. In the dark. And I am covered in goosebumps right now. Yeah. That, that yes. just, again, got into me like 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 a, a mold or something. I just, Ooh. Yeah, Tony Collette, man. She did such an amazing job in that movie. Oh, so um, we know how horror started for you. And we know, you know, your favorite horror movies. But... Before I let you go, Jeff, we always bounce back to the same question. And since we talked about Salem's Lot the most, I'll go with that. Um, what we're going to do is rank Salem's Lot on a skull count. Now, we're not going to rank this movie on acting, production, score, direction, nothing like that. We're not going to be critics. What we're doing here is ranking Salem's Lot on how much it affected you on your first viewing. So zero skulls being not effective, five being extremely effective, you can use half and quarter skulls anywhere in the middle. Uh, Jeff, what would your ranking of Salem's Lot be? It would be a five. Um, it's such a hard five um, for so many reasons. It, it made me love the genre. It made God so many got in my head. I remember I was I was upset. I was too young to watch it again, probably. But I was I, I was like I was so afraid a vampire was going to get my mom that I started praying every night. I was, we didn't grow up praying, you know, I mean, we had a little religion there, but I started praying because I was so concerned. It got in my head, you know, what if, what if a vampire gets my mom? So Again, our yeah. hero, you know, when we have our hero and we think that they're vulnerable, what does that make us? Yeah. You know? yeah. So, um, man, Jeff, I do want to thank you again for coming on and hanging out with me, man. This really does mean a lot. And like I said, I hope, by this time next year, we can bring you back to talk about your role as Sheriff LaBelle and how things went with that. But um, I do I do want to remind everybody that I do – because we're at the end of the third act, guys. The credits are about to roll and the curtain's about to drop. But before that happens, make sure you're following Jeff on social media so you can become a part of his family as well. You can stay up to date because I'm telling you, Sheriff LaBelle, Deputy LaBelle, great character. It's not his only character and for sure not going to be his only character moving forward, guys. So make sure that you're following him. So you can stay up to date on all the amazing roles he's going to have, whether it be video game, film, or television. So, Jeff, please don't go anywhere. I got a couple more questions for you. Oh, for um, sure. Everybody else, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe. It really does help the channel more than you know. And follow Sledgehammer Horror on social media. Our links are in the description as well. But until next time, keep talking horror. Stay what you are. And we'll see you guys soon.